Coming up right now on Lifestyle Magazine. It's no longer about dirty magazines and dingy video shops. The new pornography, the cybersex version, is wreaking havoc with young and old. You're about to meet someone who knows the dangers firsthand and is not afraid to tell us about it. And now the hosts of Lifestyle Magazine, Mike and Gail Tucker. Welcome. Our first guest today is the director of the Sexual Recovery Institute in Los Angeles and co-author of Untangling the Web, Sex, Porn, and Fantasy Addiction in the Internet Age. He's nationally known for his many appearances in Oprah, Dateline, NBC, and many more. Please welcome Robert Weiss. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad you're with us. Thank you. Thank you. So, Robert, how big is the problem of sexual addiction today? Well, we estimate somewhere between 3 and 5% of the population has some kind of addictive disorder with sexuality. What do we have, 300 million people in the mm -hmm. U.S.? So that's, my math's not too good, but that's a lot of folks. That is a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Well, the Internet may have had some bearing on that, do you think? Well, the is it different than porn has always been? The Internet provides access that people never had before. You know, you don't have to walk around the block or go to the bad part of town to pick up a magazine, or you can pad into the den in your in your boxers and go online, and mm -hmm. and really you can just say, I'm going to go look at my taxes, and no one really knows what you're really doing. Yeah. So the whole accessibility and affordability and, and really the anonymity mm -hmm. of the Internet is what's made it so different and so compelling for people. Do you, do you think that it, the Internet even kind of seeks you out sometimes with porn? Well, I know the Internet seeks me out with an airline ticket. You know, I can yeah. be on there for an hour and a half saving $3. Yeah. And I can imagine and talk to people who, once they start looking at one image, one porn image, and look at another and another mm -hmm. and another, and they get so caught up. In fact, that's really what the addiction is about. It's not so much about sex. It's about being in that excitement of the hunt and the chase mm -hmm. and the, this image and that image and this place and that place. That's what they're really hooked on. How does this affect families, mm -hmm. uh, spouses? I see so many ways that spouses are affected and families. Uh, everything from, uh, and there's a, a woman I worked with who, who was a spouse, and she would say that, um, you know, she would honk her horn when she was coming home with the kids to make sure that her husband knew because she knew what he was looking at on, oh you know. She would want to make sure that he knew that she was coming home with the kids so the kids wouldn't walk in on him looking at the porn. So I hear stories like that a lot. I hear stories about... Um, dad being home with the kids when mom's working or teaching mm -hmm. or something in the evening and his in his mind he just wants to get the, get the kids to bed as quickly as he can mm -hmm. or get the kids out of the way so mm -hmm. that he can get to the pornography so from not parenting not being present a lot of intimacy problems in relationships and I see a lot yeah. of issues like that what kind of a definition would you give of, of addiction how do we know that, that someone's addicted well someone's addicted if they've tried to stop either doing something or using something they're not able to. And they say to themselves, I don't like this, I don't want to keep doing this, but they keep doing it anyway. Um, other signs are things like um, th that in some way their family life is being affected or their work is being affected. You know, I've, I have guys who are staying late at the office, staying late at the office, mm -hmm. but what they're really doing is looking at porn. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine your work is affected and then you're coming home late and your life is affected. And um, people who are addicted to either substances or behaviors often also escalate in their use. In other mm -hmm. words, their use increases. Mm -hmm. You know, like the alcoholic who drinks more and more, yeah. or the drug addict who uses more and more. And the porn addict will find themselves looking maybe one hour a night, and then two hours a night, mm -hmm. and then three nights a week, and then every night, and like that. Does the nature of the material in increase as well, as, as far as severity is That's concerned? a good question, because uh, escalation, the intensity that they're trying to achieve, because it's like a drug, mm -hmm. sure. um, it increases not only with the amount of time they're looking, but also with the content. Yeah. So I will often hear men say, you know, I found myself looking at something I said I would never look at, yeah. and then two years later, there they are looking at it, seeking it out. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's mm -hmm. a progressive thing. It can be for some people, certainly. Is it just men? Or do women get involved with this? It's a very interesting question. I've been doing some work for the military lately. I've been on a couple of bases working with family therapists who treat... Um, who treat soldiers and their families. And one of the things that they're finding is that there are male soldiers who are away for long periods of time and their mm -hmm. spouses, you know, alone for a year, alone for a year and a half, find themselves going online and looking at images. Hmm. The women tend to be more interested or more moving toward a relationship kind of thing. So mm -hmm. a woman will find herself in a chat room 
you know, looking for like an emotional kind of connection, whereas a man will be more likely to just look at images or, or pornography itself. Mm -hmm. uh, women are more relationally oriented. Men like to look, you know, men, mm -hmm. men are visual. Well, does that maybe seem like a safer place? I mean, it, it's safer to do that mm -hmm. in the privacy of your home than to go out and seek an affair or, you know, seek someone else well, other than your spouse. And that's an interesting question that you raise, too, because something I often say to audiences is that w how we define infidelity has changed mm -hmm. since the it internet. It really has, hasn't mm -hmm. it? Because 20 years ago, you kind of knew what infidelity was. Mm -hmm. You know, someone was involved with someone else, and they had meetings, or they, they, they hooked up in some way. Right. But I have guys who say, well, look, you know, I may be having chatting about sex with someone, or I may even be looking at mm -hmm. images of them sexually, or them me, but I, it's not like I ever had sex with them, so right. I'm not being unfaithful. Mm -hmm. And if you ask their wives that, they'll tell you something very different. Mm -hmm. Well, what do wives think about it? Um, well, wives, feel, uh, wives are like the walking wounded. You know, I think that they're, I've worked in addiction for a long time and I think it's a lot easier for a woman to come forward and say, my husband has a drinking problem mm -hmm. or my husband is a gambling problem or a spending problem. But to mm -hmm. say my husband has a sexual problem, I mean that, it, it, it almost throws shame back on her. Absolutely. I'm not good enough. Yeah. I couldn't satisfy him, so. He... And I hear that a lot from wives. You mm -hmm. know, they'll say, at least at the beginning, they'll say, well, if only I had, maybe I should have been sexier, or maybe I should have lost more weight, or not spent as much time with the kids, or they're trying to figure out how it is that they caused this to happen, yeah. and they didn't cause it to happen. In reality, it's not actually about them, is it? It affects them, but it isn't because of them. But it's not because of them. However, someone who's doing it and wants to justify what they're doing right. will say, well, my wife is this, and why would you, who would blame me? Look, my right. wife is, you know, they'll right. blame a spouse. This is absolutely fascinating, and we've got, we've got some more to talk about here as we go. But now things are about to get really personal as we visit with a man who knows firsthand the addictive power of pornography. That's coming up next. Stay tuned. Are you looking for a way to change your life? The answer may be as easy as watching TV. Introducing Hello Channel, an exciting new channel that's designed to teach you to speak English. New opportunities will be available to you when you learn the language of the internet, commerce, travel, and diplomacy. No need to pay for your expensive schools or tutors. You can learn English by watching Hello Channel. Invest in yourself. For a brighter future, say hello. Joining us here on Lifestyle Magazine is Bernie Anderson. Bernie's an expert on pornography, an expert who knows from experience just how dangerous this can be. Welcome, Bernie. Hi. Thanks for having me. Here. Thank you. So, Bernie, you understand the, the strength and the danger of this thing called pornography, but how do you know that? Well, I, I've lived it, and uh, the reality is it was, um, it was quite devastating to, to me personally, to my family, and um, it's, it's been quite a journey to, to deal with it. And I, I went through this, and I lived it, and um, I, I can't begin to tell you how, how devastating it is and, and how impactful it's been. Um, in in my life, and right. uh, what was your earliest exposure to pornography? I was nine years old, and as a kid by nature, I was a rambler. I would rumble through the house and just <laughs> search closets and uh -huh. look for stuff. Uh -huh. And it wasn't at my own home, but at the home of a relative that I was going through a closet, just kind of on a search, you know, and and stumbled across this uh, this what turned out to be a porno pornographic magazine that uh -huh. had been ripped up and kind of thrown and discarded, and I. I looked at that, and immediately there was a there was something happened. You know, it was captivating. It really mm -hmm, was, mm -hmm. and I and I put it I put it down. But I remember making another trip back to mm -hmm. that closet another mm -hmm. time. Well, a kid has such curiosity. Absolutely, wow. and and it was yeah, and that's what it kind of captivated me. Mm -hmm. And that that I guess a seed was planted literally right. at but that I, point. But at I that bet point. you never told anybody about it. I mean, then no. And that's yeah. just a guess because we've never met before. That's but, right. but you probably learned not only about the intensity of it, but also that you needed to keep it a secret or hide it. Or yeah. you didn't go to mom and say, "Hey, mom, I was over and I found this," and you went back all on your own. So mm -hmm. true, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, immediately right then, I knew I had to keep that keep that hidden. It, right. it did, I didn't know it was bad necessarily, mm -hmm. yeah. but it 
I just knew it intuitively. was something. Intuitively. Intuitively, I yeah. knew something was something wrong. Something was wrong. Yeah, yeah. How did you deal with the whole kind of, was it like a double life kind of a thing? How do you deal with that? It really is, and I, I think that's the nature of pornography, is that it, it literally kind of splits you up. It, it, it breaks you in, in pieces, and and I had to have a part of me that looked like everything was okay, and, and then there was a part of me quietly, secretly, that struggled um, mm -hmm. with this, this with this hidden uh, problem. And, and I didn't want anybody to know about it. And probably my greatest fear, and, and it, even a sense of paranoia, was that mm -hmm. someone would find out. Right. And then my secret would be out, and what would people what would think? Mm -hmm. So I, I literally, I was, I was kind of, I created this double life, and, and one, and, and at one time I would be this way, but in the quiet, uh, secret places, I, I was a different person. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You, you know, I mean, you've got, all right, you've got this paranoia. You're worried people are going to find out. And yeah. yet there's this, there's got to be another element to this, not only guilt, but a little thing we call shame. Absolutely. In my heart, I knew I had this, this secret and, and I was doing this, this awful thing. And there was a deep sense of shame and, and a sense of, of guilt. And I just... I wanted it to go away more than anything. I, yeah. just, I, I prayed earnestly, God, we've been down this road so many times. Yeah. Can we just be done with it? And God, I, I, I just don't want to deal with it anymore. And and yeah, I, I wanted to be free of it. I, mm -hmm. I did not want to live the, the double life, but the, the shame does eat you up. Yeah. Yeah, and I've, I've heard people of faith say before that they felt like maybe God didn't love them anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard pastors, I've heard rabbis, I've heard you know, people say they prayed and prayed and prayed, or they got more and more involved in the church, but it didn't fix it because it's really, religion itself is not going to fix it. You need some kind of help. Absolutely. But you keep trying on your own to fix mm. it, and you, it's not something you can really fix by yourself. Yeah. That, that is so true. I mean, I, I thought that, I thought, number one, that I was the only guy. The only one. The only one. And I was like, I cannot, I, you know, I just got to just, you know, get tough and, and try harder and, and be done with this because I don't really don't want anyone to know about it. And man, I, I, I just want to get yeah. better. I want to be done with this. Well, thing. what is it that made you want to get better? I mean, which brought you to that point where, yeah, let's turn this corner, let's make this happen, let's not do this anymore. I, if it came at a time, I, I guess there's a point at which you really do hit a rock bottom, they say. Yeah. And I was at home alone for, for several days. My family was away. And um, I, I went through this, I, I just started looking at pornography. And I and I finally got to the end of it, and I said, "Please, this is this is enough." And this, you know, it was a binge essentially. And I just kind of threw my hands up and said, "Okay, God, I'll do whatever. Mm -hmm. I'll do whatever you ask." And uh, it was then that that God kind of whispered to me, "Would you just call a friend and mm -hmm. tell him?" Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I and uh, you know, I well, called that friend. They say the power is in the secret, right? <laughs> the power was in the secret. When yeah. the secret is out, it has no power over you. It loses a lot of power. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. like any addiction, that double life, you know, because really you can hear. I hear addiction all the way through this mm -hmm. because, yeah. um, you know, I, I look. I look one way to the world, but I have this secret. It could be drinking. It could be gambling. It could be no one would ever know that you were doing. So, pornography is just one of yeah. many addictions right. like this that people carry out and try to keep hidden. Yeah. So you told the friend, and you got some support. Yeah. And then what did you do? Where did you go to finally get some help with this? Man, I at, once I began to open up and talk about my secret was out, my deep dark secret was out. I just went in search of anything I could get my hands on that talked about this issue. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to educate myself. I wanted to find out. And and really, I for me it was a new thing. I'd never heard the term sexual addiction. Mm -hmm. I never realized it. A person could be addicted to pornography, and here yeah. I was, essentially that person. Yeah. <laughs> and and so I just I went online, and I, I found books, I found seminars, I found, and anyone who I who would talk to me about this issue, right. I'd, I'd engage them, and it, it was empowering to begin to learn about the the proliferation of pornography, what mm -hmm. it's doing to families, how it's impacting our culture, and and that that just began a, a whole process of of recovery work, essentially. Mm -hmm. What did that recovery work entail? Um, it, it involved uh, uh, attending a, a group session, uh -huh. uh, being being around other people. My, you know, my greatest fear was that I was the only guy, and I I got in this group session with a bunch of men, uh -huh. and they began to tell their stories. And I was like, wow, there, there are other people who, other men who struggle with this, mm -hmm. and that was, I, I remember just just shedding tears as I listened to those right. other men in that same struggle, and and. Whereas before, I, w I wanted to be alone and isolated. Right. 
I now was coming out and wanted to be open and That's embrace right. and talk to people. Well, you know, we there's a lot more that we need to cover here. But before we do that, we're going to take a break. There's another segment here, and there's another side to Bernie's story. And that side is coming up when his wife joins us right after this break. Just say. 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 Hello. We know where they've taken her. In a defining time. Amid a noble quest. A bond is forged. Imagine what a little time can do for your family. The princess is sleeping. Oh, sorry. Excuse us. Shh, shh. From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Welcome back. Christina, it seems that Bernie's story is your story. This has affected you as well as it has him. So. When was it that you found out that Bernie had this addiction? Um, it, well, one day I was just logging on to the computer, check email, and I started typing in the, the normal www, and I noticed something that popped up that was unfamiliar, hmm. and I clicked on it. It's kind of an instinctual thing. And when I saw what came up, which mm -hmm. was pornography, I was kind of taken aback, like maybe this was an accident. Mm -hmm. So I, I switched the computer off because I actually didn't really, at that point, I didn't want to know. I turned the computer off and I kind of backed away. And then there was something that told me that there was something that was more. Right. So I took a few seconds and I turned the computer back on and I started searching the history of the computer and yeah. I found more and more. Um, so I erased everything I found. Mm -hmm. And it took me about four days from that point to get up the nerve to confront Bernie. And mm -hmm. I actually just thought it was going to be like a one-time deal. Like, right. mm -hmm. hey, you know, I just did this once. Right. And I don't know why, yeah, but, you yeah. know, maybe. And so it'll all be okay. Yeah, yeah, it'll all be okay. So you confronted him. I did. How did that go? Um, it, it went different than what I expected, obviously. Yes. I mean, I expected, you know, him to be like, Oh, I'm sorry, you know, every guy does this once in life. Yeah. And um, what I got was Bernie crying and saying, well, I need to tell you something. And he went on to tell me about how he had been struggling with this for a long time. And I think the, the most hurtful thing or the most difficult thing at that point was he started telling me how he had been dealing with this before we had got married. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it had... In, in that moment, I went back to everything that had happened in our relationship, and it tainted, everything. for me, everything. Mm -hmm. We hear this a lot from spouses. Yeah. You know, this idea, because the guys are thinking, well, if she sees this or that, she's going to leave or hate me. Yeah. Or, but for the spouses, it's just the whole, like, we've lived together so long, I thought I knew you so well, and now I don't know who I'm married to. It's mm. like, it's, just, it's betrayal, really, is the big issue. Like your life together has been a lie. Yeah, like, exactly, like our children, the births, every moment that we had together meant something different for him than it did for me. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it was it was a heartbreaking moment, actually, for me. Was there any self-doubt? Did you worry, you know, what about me? Yeah, a lot. Because, you know, you look at the girls on magazine covers and they, <laughs> boy, <laughs> I yeah. especially don't look anything like oh. a girl on a magazine <laughs> cover. And so um, there was a lot of self-doubt. And of course, Bernie he tried to reassure me that it had nothing to do with me. But at that time, I didn't know anything about pornography no. addiction. I yeah. didn't know where the root came from. I just knew that my husband had been looking at other women for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And um, it took me a long time to get past that self-doubt. I, mm -hmm. I had to actually do a lot of 
reading and praying and soul searching mm -hmm. and actually investing in my own self mm -hmm. to finally get past that. Bernie, what was it like for you to kind of bare your soul, if you will, to your wife when she caught you? Yeah, it was it was a relief in one sense yeah. because there, there are times through this whole thing where I wanted to be caught. Of course. I wanted to be found out, especially by my wife. And, and yet at the same time, I knew it would cause such devastation and pain to her. And, and I didn't want that to happen. I did not want to hurt my wife in any way. And, and that's why I think a lot of men say, it's just my problem if I just keep it hidden right, and quiet. Right. It won't hurt anybody else. And yet in reality, you, you are hurting, mm -hmm. that you're tainting in the entire relationship. And so mm -hmm. it was extremely hard. And, and I didn't want to hide it. I didn't want to run. Yeah. And so that's why I said, yeah, this you caught me. I, yeah. I've been doing what, this. What was the time frame like between the time that Christina found out what was going on and when you told someone else? I think it was a good year. I mean, we went through... And, and the, so you guys suffered through this alone for some time. For some time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We suffered alone. And, and the, the most painful and devastating part is that while at that time I confessed and said, yeah, there were, I still wasn't ready for real turnaround and change. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I would confess and say, yeah, I'm not going to do it anymore. And, and then, then she'd find back. me again and I'd yeah. go back to it. So that was extremely painful, I know, for, for her. Yeah, that had to be devastating. It had to be devastating. Yeah. Yeah. There's no to bottom to it. It never ends. You yeah. Know, yeah. When you're on a treadmill, I'm stopping, and then you don't, and I'm stopping. And the spouse thinks, okay, now it's going to be okay, and then it isn't. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. And then they feel like, well, when, it, when is it going to be okay? Yeah. Well, it becomes a trust issue, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. If you can't trust him, you know, could you ever trust him? Have you mm -hmm. regained that? Uh, yeah, I, I believe we have. We. Mm -hmm. I think that... Um, He's shown me in not just in the pornography way, but in all aspects of our life, our family life together and our marriage, that he's a different person. Mm. And he's a completely different person than the person that I married 13 years ago. Is that mm. right? In the last, I would say, two and a half years, I've seen a, such a transformation in him that it makes me believe in him and it makes me believe in us. This is exciting. And it's exciting for anyone watching this program to know that that is actually... A possibility very much yeah, that healing and recovery is a possibility well there is more to come so I'm going to invite you to stay with us because we will be right back hello 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 We have had an intriguing conversation. Bernie, you have a book coming out? Yes, a book coming out called Breaking the Silence. And Breaking it's, the Silence. It's our stories. Um, much, much of what we shared here today is, is in that book. It, in that book. And mm -hmm. that will be on our website, by the Absolutely. way. Robert, briefly tell us, what are the components of a lasting recovery? The, the key to all of this, I think, in terms of understanding pornography's addiction is... Saying you have an addiction is not an excuse to keep doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like saying I have diabetes. If a doctor says you have diabetes, it means you have to start to measuring your blood, take insulin. If you recognize you have this problem, then you have to attend to it. Mm -hmm. um, being an addict means you have to deal with it and seek recovery, and you guys clearly have. And the good news is that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. That there is help available. There is help out there. And people can find that help. One place to find it is going to our website and we're going to list some of those resources for them. And I want to thank you guys for being a part of this, for your openness and your vulnerability. And I want to thank you for watching us. And I'd like to invite you to visit our website for more information and resources. That's lifestyle.org. Again, thank you for being here. We will see you again next time on Lifestyle Magazine.